Now let's look at what happens in the charge conference. This is where the organization and administration of the pastoral charge and the church or churches is confirmed. It is much like the annual meeting of a corporation, but that is not a very theologically profound description. It bleeds over into business language, but the meeting is a required annual meeting of the charge. Only elected members of the church leadership have voice and vote in the charge conference. The pastor and the paid staff do not vote. You may have to have more than one charge conference in any given year. It is not the same as a church council meeting. There are certain requirements for holding a charge conference. You cannot hold a charge conference without the permission of the district superintendent. And either the DS or another assigned elder has to chair the charge conference. Sometimes you can be given permission to chair your own charge conference, but I don't recommend that. Only in the event of having to, say, approve a person going through candidacy, who the congregation has known forever, or some other easy issue, would I ever give someone permission to chair his or her own charge conference. If the charge conference has to deal with property manners, and this is the main reason for holding a special called charge conference, and you are given permission to chair the conference, you eliminate your right to speak for or against the issue. You cannot convene and have a voice at the same time. You don't want to lose your voice in a process like that. And if you are not comfortable with chairing a meeting or are not up on Robert's rules of order, much as I dislike them, don't agree to chair these kinds of meetings. The best run meetings, not the best manipulated meetings, are those in which everyone gets a chance to speak within reason. And if you are running the meeting, you don't get a chance to speak. This is my own bias as a former DS and a former church pastor. The regular charge conference usually happens in the fall, somewhere between early September and early December. This is when the total ministry of the church is evaluated and done so in the, seri in a, in the context of a series of reports. You will receive from your DS or you will be directed by your DS to a website link from where all the required forms will be, um, will be located for you to download. Then you work from those directions and those forms. If you are the pastor of a small church, then you may be the only one who fills out those forms. That's not a particularly bad thing, because then when you get to a larger church and have others available to help, you will understand what you are asking them to do. You will know what to expect of others who fill out the reports. Now, no matter who fills out the reports, the buck stops with the pastor or the senior pastor of the church. It reflects on your credibility. So when you share those reports, you have to identify those with credibility and skill to fill them out. And yet, as your ministry expands, you will have to depend on others to do this work well. Now, there are four, some forms that you are required to fill out or to compile, no matter what the size of the staff or the elected leadership team. It's a pain, yes, and probably the most frustrating thing about those charge conference reports is that a number of them will, have, will go into a folder somewhere and never get viewed again, and then another set of them will, you'll have to du duplicate them at the end of the year for the statistical reports. You will sit there and go, why do I have to fill out all these reports twice? And I agree, it is as much of a pain for the district superintendent and the district administrator as it is for you. Just remember, they have to review these same reports from all of the charges, not just yours. So the clearer and more accurate both sets of reports are, the better terms you will be on with the district office. Now at the charge conference, you are required to elect a recording secretary for the charge. It happens right at the beginning of the meeting. If you have a church administrator, it is often this person or the secretary of the church council. Some conferences use a form called the minutes, 
Uh, so some of those forms aren't even filled out before the meeting gets started. This way all you are doing is simply um, signing the forms at the end of the meeting and the DS walks away with the folder of the minutes and the reports. Now charge conferences examine, recommend, and renew candidates for ministry and church-related vocations. This is done following a candidate's meeting with the SPR committee. Some of you have already been through this. Some charge conferences just do this in a perfunctory way and others take it very seriously. The charge conference also reviews the gifts and work and usefulness of any lay speakers, now called lay servants in the discipline, and certified lay ministers. Both lay servants and ministers are trained to assist with a wide range of responsibilities in the life of the local church. Many pastors, especially in smaller churches, benefit greatly from the work of lay servants and ministers. Some are quite capable of filling in with preaching on a Sunday morning and actually welcome such an opportunity. Others are called to a variety of helping ministries and extend the work of the pastor out into the community. Some pastors steer away from the assistance of lay servants and ministers because, quite frankly, some can be more of a hindrance than a help. But this really boils down to a matter of finding the right places for people to serve in light of their particular gifts and graces. Sometimes leadership in these roles helps people discover a call into ministry. Others think that these positions give them the right to act as a pastor without the accountability. So as a pastor, one has to be cautious about who and how you encourage into these particular roles in the church. The charge conference is also required to receive reports from UMVIM, United Methodist Volunteers in Mission, the teams that go from your local church. This requirement was added in the past several years. UMVIM teams used to act pretty independently of everything else going on in the church. Now these are groups of passionately committed people doing good work, but they needed to get tied into their local churches and have a link of accountability somewhere in the system. And so this has become a good thing because now other church members better understand the work of United Volunteer, Methodist Volunteers in Mission. The church conference is also where the pastor's compensation is set and that of other appointed staff as well. This does not have to go through the church council prior to coming before the charge conference. It can be challenged from the floor of the charge conference. It is determined by the SPR committee and presented by the chairperson of the SPR or if you have a PPR committee. Now the charge conference has to vote on a membership report that is the responsibility of the pastor. This is one of those you have to do. This includes numbers of baptisms, those entering on profession of faith, transfers, how many people have been transferred out, who has died, and who are being removed by charge conference vote. Reaffirmations of faith are included here as well. These are persons who were baptized somewhere at some time, were maybe active, and then became inactive and were no longer members, and now want to join. This church um, again or they're wanting to join this church having not been a member anywhere for a long time. These are the persons who often ask about rebaptism, which we've really already talked about. Removal by charge conference approval is a unique procedure in the United Methodist Church. These persons those persons who cannot be found or who have no address are the ones who show up on this list. Their names have to be publicized over a two-year period beginning several weeks before a charge conference. Their names are then read at the first charge conference and then publicized and read again for two more charge conferences. At the third charge conference they can be removed from the roll. I recommend establishing a regular cycle where this is done all the time 
so fewer names are always on the list, rotating as having been read for the first, second, and then for a third time. Some pastors, district superintendents, and even bishops discourage this action at times, but I personally believe that it is a healthier process, it's a healthy process for a local church to have a sense of the number of real members in the church. A charge conference is where policies of the denomination and conferences are promoted. For example, this is where one this is one where all churches had to approve a safe sanctuaries policy. So this responsibility is pretty self explanatory. The next responsibility is the provision for the upkeep and maintenance of the parsonage. The Florida Conference does this through the submittal of an annual form that requires one visit to the parsonage and review of its needs per year. Different conferences do this in different ways. Now you may think this next point is a bit of a diversion, but it's important. If you think this issue of the parsonage is trivial, let me just share with you a story, a true story. I once received an email from a former student who told me that he could not move into his parsonage of his new charge because the former pastor had not let the trustees or parsonage committee into the house for a number of years. When the former pastor left, the parsonage was in such awful shape that the new pastor could not move in without the church going through a lot of unplanned expense and work to repair and clean the parsonage. The person reported to me that there were 32 plastic trash bags of garbage in the garage when the former pastor and his family left. As the superintendent, I would have brought up that pastor on charges. Because if the pastor doesn't let the charge keep up their, their responsibilities, and if the pastor and his or her family uh, doesn't keep the parsonage in a reasonable, reasonable enough condition, for someone else to move in, it means that neither the church is allowed to fulfill its responsibility and the new pastor is not able to do his work or her work. Now obviously this is an extreme case, but it illustrates the point. Now this situation was resolved because the pastor had a certain amount of funds in his FSA, his flexible spending account for medical costs that because he was being moved, they had to be returned to him. To make a long story short, um, those FSA funds, the pastor agreed for those FSA funds to be used to reimburse the church for the costs of what they had to do to the parsonage. Now my husband says I organize by the stacking method. He calls me a stackologist. I had to learn how to keep my parsonage presentable. If it means you have to bring someone in every three months to shovel it out after you, then you do that. It may mean that instead of four dogs and three cats, you only have one. If you have any animals, put away money each month to replace the carpet or to pay for wall-to-wall -wall tile. Conferences used to not even allow animals in the parsonage, but that is not really fair. But you have to clean up after yourself and take care of the house and be sure that the charge takes care of it as well. Next, there is a list of specific lay positions that have to be elected at the charge conference. Lay leader, church council chair, board of trustees members, Committee on Nominations and Church Leadership, which you as the pastor chair, lay member of, an an, of the annual conference, recording secretaries, and so forth. Some churches have salaried financial secretaries and treasurers. These are not elected. Whether elected or salaried, these two persons cannot be the same person. Now, our last but not least point is what is the difference between the charge conference and a church conference? The charge conference and the church conference are basically the same except that in a church conference 
all professing members, not baptized members, but all professing members have voice and vote. While in the charge conference, all can attend, but only the elected leaders of the charge have voice and vote. A church conference can be held instead of a charge conference, uh, you know, during that fall time of the year, that regular charge conference time, at the discretion of the district superintendent or following a written request um, to the DS from the pastor, or at the request of 10% of the professing members of the charge. Now the DS can still override the request of the pastor or the 10% membership request for a church conference and still hold a charge conference. The church conference is required for the pro approval of the preliminary plans for building and financing new building and lands. Final plans go to the charge conference. Other than that, there's really very little difference. Your determination as to whether you'll hold a charge conference or church conference may simply have to do with the tradition of the church itself. But sometimes you can think through strategically what is the best way to get the greatest amount of support for a particular change or something that's important if you use a church conference or a charge conference.